Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. Integrity in politics has been in the spotlight, with the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison being censured by the Parliament over his secret ministries and a National Anti-Corruption Commission passing this week. The Commission will begin operating next year, but who will be hauled before it first? Today, Radio National Breakfast host Patricia Carvillis on how the new body could go some way to restoring confidence in our political system. PK, I want to talk to you soon about how this National Anti-Corruption Commission is going to work. But first, let's spend a bit of time having a look at the sort of things it could investigate. And I think we really have to start with Scott Morrison, right? Appointing himself to at least five ministerial roles. He's been censured in the parliament, it's a pretty unusual thing to happen, isn't it? It's extraordinary. You don't see prime ministers being censured like this. The core of responsible government was breach with the multiple appointments. He owes an apology to the Australian people for the undermining of democracy. Uh, And we saw a vintage Scott Morrison response, really. I have no intention now, Mr Speaker, of submitting to the political intimidation of this government using its numbers in this place to impose its retribution on a political opponent. Um, You know, he talked about it being political intimidation. He says what he did was not a power grab. It was simply a dormant redundancy, this five portfolios. It is strange to describe such actions as a power grab as they were never exercised or even used to exercise influence over the relevant ministers. It was a bit of a sorry, not sorry um, kind of scenario. You know, when you're in a sort of toxic relationship and someone says sorry, but they really don't mean sorry. That's what it felt like to me, because he did the I apologise to those offended. Mr Speaker, I acknowledge that the non-disclosure of arrangements has caused unintentional offence and extend an apology to those who were offended. He thought his office had told the finance minister who was Matthias Cormann back then, and of course then it became Simon Birmingham. He thought he'd told them, it's like everyone's fault but his. Had I been asked about these matters at the time, at the men- numerous press conferences I held, I would have responded truthfully about the arrangements I had put in place. Order. The recommendations of the Bell Inquiry will appropriately remedy this deficiency in the future, and I support them. He does accept the findings of the Virginia Bell report that found his actions were corrosive of trust in government. And I thought there was a bit of cognitive dissonance going on there, you know, accepting all of the recommendations, but the conclusions that that lead to the recommendations, you clearly don't really accept or you don't fully accept because you're, you're sitting there defending yourself. He still gets censured because the government has the numbers on the floor and that's the way the cookie crumbles. The result of the division is ayes 86, noes 50. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Mm, So it's a a sorry from Scott Morrison that we misunderstood his intentions rather than a true apology, I guess. So, PK, is this something a national anti-corruption commission could actually look at? No, at this stage, most people don't think so. I can't Mm. find anyone who says that this would fall within it. Uh, It's obviously very interesting, but it isn't contrary to the law. The the Anti-Corruption Commission will more likely look at more concerns about serious corruption and not merely what's inappropriate or questionable behaviour. And and his actions have clearly deeply damaged public trust in government, in the institution of the parliament, in the integrity of the political system. But because it's not a breach per se, I can't see this falling into the remit of this new body. You know, if you look at what corrupt behaviour is definitionally, it's someone willing essentially to use their power to be dishonest, do illegal things in return for money or some kind of kickback of some sort. I can't see how Scott Morrison gained anything materially from this, so I don't think this would fall in it. But, you know, this doesn't make it right, and that's why we've seen a censure motion and the Parliament take it quite seriously. 
Mm, okay, so PK, let's look then at what sort of things this body will investigate because it does have retrospective powers, doesn't it? Yeah, the retrospectivity is quite key and I think quite important, uh, of course. So it could look at misconduct going back as far as 15 years and that's pretty substantial period of time, I think, especially if the politicians or the public servants remain in senior positions. Now, of course, when you get into the 15-year mark, if you go that far back, fewer and fewer are, but yeah, there are some. But it would cover right up until the end of the, the John Howard prime ministership. So that means the Rudd Gillard government and then the, the you know, three different prime ministers under the uh, coalition governments. The Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, has said it won't be an endless witch hunt. He has said it could investigate things like the so-called sports rorts. The $100 million grants program was rolled out in the months before the 2019 federal election. But eight months later, the National Audit Office delivered a bombshell report finding the scheme favoured marginal and targeted seats. I thought that it was a rort on any view with 51 coloured spreadsheets revealed by the Auditor General. That looked pretty corrupt to me. But it would be up to the Commission. You know, that's the thing. They can determine it based on the recommendations they get and what what they think they've got enough uh, evidence to pursue. Anthony Albanese has also often used that example when making the case for a federal anti-corruption commission, right? Like when he was in opposition talking about wanting to do this, he did talk about those rorts. He's also pointed to the so-called car park rorts, which the coalition government promised $660 million in grants for commuter car parks at the, the 2019 election. But in reality... I don't, both these things may not actually fit the definition of serious or systemic corruption. So I'm not, I'm not certain that they would, but of course that's up to this new commission when it's established in the next, you know, the first half of next year, it's going to be spending a lot of time actually just getting itself into a functioning form. It will be, you know, ball in their court what they decide to pursue. Mm, so they might not look particularly at sort of pork barrelling itself, but but as you say, we don't know yet. No. But what other things PK might it look at? So it could, for instance, look at a previous minister being appointed as a consultant, passing on, you know, confidential information. It could do lots of things. Uh, and this could be some things, Sam, that we don't even know about that have happened, right? This is the thing. They can take tip-offs and, and pursue things. So there could be things they hear about and they decide to investigate that haven't been necessarily in the press. We often and focus on things we know about. But there are things we don't. And that's why it's such an important body, because when a whistleblower is able to provide some evidence that something may have happened and they can pursue it, then I suspect we will find out later uh, what, you know, where these corruptions may have happened. Mm, I tell you, there might be just a few nervous people out there then, PK. Uh, let's have a look then at how it's going to operate because there were some changes along the way. The government did have to compromise a little bit, although it seemed to get the majority of what it wanted through the parliament. But what were the sort of sticking points? Okay, so under the Labor m- bill and model, the government's commissioner and inspector must be endorsed by this oversight committee made up of six government, four opposition and two crossbench MPs and senators. In the end, the crossbench won a concession that the government will need uh, the support of one non-government MP for the appointment to go through. You know, there's the idea that, you know, that's not, not you know, you don't just stack it with your own people. That was the concern. Another really contentious part was whether it would hold public hearings. In fact, I think that's the thing that was the most contentious coming into this debate. Crossbenchers accused Labor of kind of doing a deal with the opposition on this thing, which the, the language that they've put in the legislation is exceptional circumstances, uh, that public hearings like the ones people might be listening thinking, what are you talking about? If you think of New South Wales and people might be listening in different parts of Australia or the world, but in New South Wales where you see some of these public hearings, you know, there, there was the view that you need to make sure that you have those as, as often as you can when they're necessary, but the government has used this language of exceptional circumstances and the crossbench and others were concerned that and, and the Greens that the that the bar is too high for when you'd have those public well, hearings. what are exceptional circumstances? The test for this commission's jurisdiction is going to be serious or systemic corruption. Now, if you've got serious or systemic corruption, it should be exceptional and you should be here. The public should have an insight into what's going on. So, But if you have 
those two tests sitting together, as well as having exceptional circumstances, it's going to make it very, very hard for this commission to hold public hearings. Some argue that weakens the body. Uh, others say it's good because you don't want a sort of people who are just giving evidence. They're actually not under trial, so to speak, being smeared by the process because it's a it's a process of trying to ascertain what's happened, fact finding. Um, and then courts later deal with consequences. You know, it will be up and running by the middle of next year, so this is a real thing now, Mm -hmm. which is extraordinary if you think about the debates we've had over years now about this thing. And it will be able to compel the production of documents or information, uh, obtain a warrant to enter and search premises under a Commonwealth premises, seize evidence, you know, Mm. have covert investigative powers such as telecommunications, interception powers, use surveillance devices. Like basically, you know, if they get a warrant, be able to tap your phone if they have some, some information that they believe that some corruption is going on. So this is... This is significant, Sam. It's a really important moment, I think, in Australian history. Mm, So we might have to put the popcorn away because it sounds like there's not going to be too many public hearings. But in essence, PK, this sounds like a really powerful body. It is powerful and that's important. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you need to see how it works and what it's able to do and whether it restores public confidence because that's key. I think it does change everything in terms of the federal parliament and the idea of uh, transparency around that. Every state and territory has one of these things, Sam. Like, this is what happens. Doesn't mean corruption goes away overnight, but if you know that there is a mechanism for accountability, I think people can start feeling a little more trusting about the institution of the parliament. And I think it's important because I think uh, democracy is something we should jealously protect and strengthen because... Um, it's it's a, a very good thing we have that we are able to elect our politicians to do their jobs well and we can scrutinise them properly and make sure that they're not taking kickbacks or not currying favour or not doing anything, well, if I can be blunt, dodgy. Patricia Carvelis is the host of Radio National Breakfast. You can hear more of her analysis on the Party Room podcast with Fran Kelly, dropping later today. The Attorney-General Mark Dreyfus says he'd like to see the National Anti-Corruption Commission up and running by mid-2023. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer this week is Sydney Peed. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.